Well, Pastor Tom, I'm going to hand it off to you. Can we give him a, a hand as he comes forward? He's just been doing, uh, just been sharing God's word. It's been amazing. It's been a blessing and an honor to have you here. Thank you so much. Hallelujah. Good, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Well, our setting is a little bit different tonight because there was a heavy rain a little while ago, I guess through the afternoon. We, uh, I appreciate the team that sets up the tents every week, but we're inside for those watching online you may not know the setting but we are inside uh this is a building that is used for food pantry ministry and it is an incredible ministry of victory assembly hundreds of families receiving food so i sort of feel honored that we're in here tonight and i believe you just have come through vbs is that right or did it just conclude or is it still still happening every tuesday wow so i know that there's a lot of fruit this this church is doing an incredible job in reaching out People are still coming in. I know some are in their cars and um, some watching online. So we welcome all of you. We're going to move right into our study tonight. And we are now in Revelation and chapter 8. You have received notes as you came in this evening. There's a little formatting issue, I guess, and some of the lines got a little shifted. But I think everything is very legible there. And for those who are online, um, there are notes, um, full highlighted notes. Um, that are available. It is on the Revelation Study group page. And so um, if you would like to access those, you just go through my Facebook page, Thomas Kindeth, and uh, request to be put on the, the study page and we'll get you those notes. If you're watching online, you may want those or you can order the book and follow along with even more detail. We've already prayed. Let's move right into Revelation chapter 8. And... This is an incredible place within the events of the book of Revelation because now, this evening, we're going to, and each one of these chapters has been so filled with um, such monumental shifts and events, developments, um, and uh, you know, I'm not gonna take time tonight because I've done this each evening to bring an overview, but you'll remember that we were just in chapter seven and what was so unique about chapter 7 is that for the very, very first time, you see in heaven the body of Christ. You see the church gathered before the throne of God. Um, what is so important to remember, and we're going to see it very early on in these notes again, is that the scroll has not actually opened yet until, and I have that replica. Now I noticed that one of the seven seals has broken on my replica, so we might be expecting um, judgment at any point now. <laughs> okay, I'm not sure. I think it was the plague, <laughs> which uh, is happening. No, I do believe that, um, you know, we are in the beginning of sorrows um, that Jesus did speak of uh, in Luke chapter 21, the parallel passages, Matthew 24. You may want to see that in those earlier verses. I do believe that that's where we are. I don't believe that we are in the tribulation time. That happens once the scroll is opened. And I think it's so important once again to remember that the body of Christ is seen before the throne of God. Um, let me go right to the notes because I think that we can unfold this uh, in, in a way that will bring a little bit of review but get everybody on the same page. Um, let's go to verse 1, chapter 8 and verse 1. When he, and this is the Lamb of God, this is Jesus. Uh, remember in chapter 5 that Jesus comes before the Father and he is announced as the line of the tribe of Judah. Uh, we see that he's fulfilling the Davidic covenant. Um, do remember that so much from the Old Testament, this is the most Old Testament, New Testament book of over 400 allusions back to the Old Testament. So here is Jesus presented, announced as the lion of the tribe of Judah, but he appears as the Lamb of God slain. We're going to see in Revelation 13, 8, uh, that Jesus is spoken of as the lamb who was slain before the foundations of the earth. So this is the will of God. This is the plan of redemption. We call it redemption history from the book, from cover to cover, Genesis to Revelation. And we're seeing this fulfilled because it is, it is the lamb of God who approaches the throne of the father in the right hand of the father, the hand of authority and favor. The father bring, gives the scroll. I see it as a very similar parallel passage to Daniel and chapter 7. You may want to read that passage because you see you see the one, and I believe it's the, the Messiah, one who appears as a son of man. In other words, he's 
He is divine because he's receiving worship, but he appears as a human being. He is the God-man. He is the Lord Jesus Christ. And there in Daniel 7, same picture, he comes before the, the Ancient of Days, is how Daniel speaks of him. So the Father is committing in both passages, Daniel 7 and Revelation in chapter 5, the Father is committing into the hands, into the authority, entrusting to the Lord Jesus kingdom and authority and power and judgment. And so the Lamb has, if you remember in chapter 5, and, and he alone is able, to, he alone has the ability. He is able, that is the key phrase there in chapter 5, he is able to break the seals, to open the scroll, to look inside, to release the judgments. When we get into chapter 6, it is the Lamb of God who has opened all six of those seals. Now we come to chapter 8 and verse 1. After chapter 7, Israel is marked as servants of the Lord. God has a remnant. There's going to be a national revival. We'll touch on that when we look at Zechariah. Again, tonight I'm going to touch on that passage. And then we see the body of Christ. But once the body of Christ is there seen before the throne of God, we come to verse chapter 8, verse 1. He, the Lamb, opened the seventh seal. For the very first time, the scroll can open. You say, as a reminder, then what are the seal judgments and the breaking of those seals? Again, panoramic view, a prophetic look forward because the scroll hasn't actually opened. Look at the notes, follow with me. We have this mysterious scroll. That's an ancient book that was the form sealed with seven seals in the hands of, of Jesus. As you have this line there, a reminder, a seven sealed scroll is in that day, only one document in Roman law required seven witnesses, seven uh, uh, insignia, seven seals into wax as we have this replica to seal it up until the appropriate time, until the death of the testator, until the time when the inheritance is released. And uh, I believe that that's what we are dealing with here. Look at this, the six seals of chapter six, again, panoramic description of what is to come once the book is open. It is now open in chapter eight and verse one. So what is being released? What's inside this scroll? Remember this, it is the Father's will. This scroll, I believe, represents, and John speaks to the people of that day, the culture of that day, they would have known a seven sealed scroll. They would have understood this is a last will and testament. We see this theologically. We understand that this is God's will. This is the Father's will. Do you understand that when we speak of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, there is one God, one being, three persons. I've heard people try to describe the Trinity. It is a mystery. I've heard everything from a triangle to an egg. Um, I may have shared this with you. To me, what works best if you're going to try to find a natural analogy, is one to the third power. Remember that from math class, one with a little three next to it, to the right, and it's one times one times one still equals one. But there's three ones. And even the Hebrew word uh, that is used in the Old Testament does not speak of an absolute uh, unity, it's a compound unity. Within the one, within the Trinity, are three persons. And yet, one person is not more superior than another person. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are co-equal, we say theologically. In other words, each are equally God. You can't have one without the other. God is complete, the Godhead. And yet, they are cooperative. In other words, and this is why I'm saying this, when the Father decrees, it is the Son who fulfills the decree. When the Father wants to create this physical world. It was through the word that he created. When the Father decrees um, recreation, in other words, that we would come to know him, we would be washed from our sin, it was through the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, everything that the Father decrees, the first person of the Trinity, is fulfilled through the second person of the Trinity. And the third person, the Holy Spirit, accentuates and ministers what Jesus has done. So I want us to understand that. That it is the Father's will, but he's fulfilling the will through Jesus. Jesus executes the will of the Father. Jesus executes the inheritance. He executes the last will and testimony. Do you follow what I'm saying? 
without the Lord Jesus Christ, we would not be, we would not receive a, a, an inheritance as co-heirs. So again, verse one, go to this. What are we seeing in the scroll? Inside, as the lamb breaks this seventh seal, inside is God's will and his final directive. He's saying, this, my son, this is how it will be fulfilled. This is how I will um, I will re re recover, restore everything that humanity has sold under sin. We forfeited. God wanted to bless us as a human race. God wanted to walk with us in the cool of the day. He wanted fellowship with us. What did we do? Very, very early, we rebelled against the Lord. We forfeited the inheritance whether it was the physical world at that point in all of its beauty and perfection, paradise, or just the presence of the Lord above all things. We forfeited that inheritance. Jesus, by the will of the Father, restores. That's what we're seeing as the Lamb breaks the seventh seal. Look again, when he opened, following the notes, when he opened the seventh seal, do you understand that you cannot open the scroll? until the seventh seal is broken. I want to take you back for a moment to Daniel chapter 12 because I have alluded to Daniel before. Um, you really must study the book of Daniel close to the book of Revelation. Uh, there is so much parallel there. I had the privilege, you know, just a shout out to the University of Valley Forge. Maybe some of our students are watching. But I had the privilege of teaching Daniel and Revelation class last semester there at the school. And I think in the spring, again, and there's such a marriage of these two books. I would urge you, after we get through the book of Revelation or parallel to it, go into the book of Daniel as well. But look what he said, Daniel chapter 12. You have your Bibles, your electronic devices. Follow with me there. I want you to see this. In chapter 12, at that time, Michael, and he is the archangel, he is a messenger angel, um, but uh, as Gabriel, but he's also an angel that is leading in warfare. So um, he is an archangel, a high-ranking angel. At that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, in other words, on commission, on assignment uh, for the nation of Israel, there will be a time of distress. I believe that's what we're about to see released in this scroll. There will be a time of distress such has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. So Daniel is instructed, this is a future event, but at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book will be delivered. We're going to see that part of the plan, and in a few moments, I'm gonna break this down as to, I, and I mentioned this last week, but now we'll, we'll, we'll look with a little bit more detail. Part of the intention Part of the events that are taking place during the tribulation is that God has an, appoint, uh, an appointment with the nation of Israel. And there is going to be, I believe, a national revival. And this is what Daniel is told. Your people, at that time your people, everyone whose name is found written in the, in the book will be delivered. Those whose names are written in the Lamb's book. In other words, they're not saved by virtue of being Jewish. They are saved because as a Jewish person, they are made complete. They understand that it is the Messiah. We're going to look in Zechariah. They're going to weep and, and as they see the Messiah with his nail-pierced hands. They're going to weep as one who weeps for their own son. They're going to recognize the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake. I'm in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2. In other words, this is also the time of the resurrection. This is the end of time. This is not something that was happening before Jesus, uh, before his birth. This is long range, end of time. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever may be the 144,000 Jewish people who are servants. They're leading others, lead many to righteousness. They're on assignment. They are servants of the Lord during the, during the tribulation time. But follow verse 4. But you, Daniel, close up and seal the words of the scroll until the time of the end. Many will go here and there to increase knowledge. There is a unique time at the time of the end, but Daniel is talking, it's not yet. You need to look long range, the end of time, 
aligning with the time of the resurrection. How many understand the day of the resurrection has not happened yet? So in other words, Daniel is seeing something that we know from the New Testament comes at the return, the revelation of Jesus Christ. I bring this to you because it is a parallel to what we read in Revelation 8 and verse 1. This scroll is sealed up until a certain point. Even the breaking of six seals has not yet opened the scroll. I, I give you this very, very rough and simple replica just to explain. You cannot open the scroll until all seven seals are broken. I think we got that. Okay? But that's so important here. Let's move on. Uh, because once the, the seventh seal is broken and the lamb has broken every one of these systematically, once that seventh seal is broken, now the scroll rolls open and look what happens. There's silence. Go back to chapter 8 and verse 1. There was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Now scholars, Bible students will speculate on what this means. I will just give you my thoughts. I believe that when you consider that the six seals are a panoramic view, I've said it's like a preface to the book. You're getting uh, an upfront view of what's coming. But when you actually open the scroll and see the details, when and now there is a view, you're going to look with, with John now, we'll take a view into the earth, we'll see real time, the actual destruction, the, the, the level of, 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 of death, the magnitude of death, the magnitude of sorrow, the magnitude of the shaking of the heavens and the earth. When you see that real time, I believe it produces a holy hush. Now think about it. And I have the question, all right, well, who's in heaven that keeps silent now? Let's just do a little review for a moment. I have this for you. Who is in heaven? Who is in the, what we would call, the Jewish people would call the third heavens? First heaven is what you see, the sky. Second heaven is, the, for the Jewish people, would be the universe as we would think of it beyond what the natural eye can see. But the third heaven is the throne room of God. What, who is there? Who is there that, that we have already seen? Well, we know Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is there. We see the Father. He's on the throne. One who sat on the throne mysteriously. We see the Lamb of God. We know that he will be seated at the right hand of the Father. He is, he is God himself, and yet he's taken on human form. People have asked, so how will we see Jesus? Because he's God. He's the Father. I mean, you know, Jesus, even in Isaiah chapter 9, is called the everlasting Father. The Messiah is called, so they're one. They're, so will we see Jesus separate? I think we will. Here's why. Not because he's a separate God, there's only one God, but because he's my elder brother. He takes on human form, so he's the God-man. I believe we will see Jesus, nail-pierced hands. We will see him at the right hand of the Father as our elder brother, but we'll also see the Spirit of the living God. And John describes the Spirit as seven furnaces or fire pots around the throne, in front of the throne. In other words, complete ministry of the Spirit. So we know that God is there. We know that the Trinity is there. Who else is there? We read about angels, myriads times myriads, which literally translates 10,000 times 10,000. Let's do the math. 100 million. That was the highest number in the Greek language. But it also metaphorically, uh, linguistically meant um, you can't number it. It was just a, a general way of saying more than what you could number. So many angels in heaven, holy angels, they're there. They're making a lot of wonderful noise according to Revelation chapter 5 and, 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 uh, and, and you know, you see that there's crescendos of worship and the angels just amp it up even more. So much, but now they're silent. Angels are silent for this time. Four living creatures, they're there as well. Just go back, remember with me, we were introduced to them. You're going to see four living creatures again yet. But chapter 4, and I, I happen to think the four living creatures are cherubim. That is the way that Ezekiel, a uh, very, very parallel in the way he describes, and he called them cherubim, very high-ranking angels, but they're silent too. I believe that they reflect all of the created universe, they are, or at least nature, the natural world, uh, humanity, but also every animal in creation and all of you know the four living creatures represent nature all of nature bringing work 24 elders 
whether they are resurrected human beings, John has a view into eternity, uh, representing, or they're angels, but they represent the people of God from the Old Testament, New Testament. So this is a little bit of review. And then we also see who else is there, the multitude, from chapter 7. And they are without number from every nation and language group and tribe and so on. So in other words, you have this indescribable multitude of human beings, resurrected human beings, angels that you cannot even number. And there's been so much worship, waves and waves, crescendos of worship. And now it's silent. Now it says a half an hour. In heaven, it's timeless. It's eternity. So it has to be a human way of describing a brief period of time. What is it? Why? There's different speculation, but this is what I feel. I believe it's a holy hush. I believe that when, especially the people of God, angels as well, God knows what's coming. But when we get this view, and we're going to see what's inside the scroll all the way through chapter 18, judgment, wrath, details of judgment and wrath. When we see that, I believe we're taken back. I don't believe, you know, again, there's wonderful music and, and worship and it's loud in heaven and comes to a quick halt. I think it's because, sort of like we're taken back breathless. How can we even speak? It is holy because God is in control, but it's almost like, oh my, this is reality. This is not just what's coming. Now we see it. You follow what I'm saying? I think that's important. You do not have a detail of judgment outlined with the seventh, uh, the seventh seal. Do you understand that? You have details. You have something affixed to each seal. You have a conqueror. You have uh, cataclysmic things in the heavens and the earth. You have all of this detail, six seals in a row. You don't have with the seventh. The seventh seal does not have a detail. What the seventh seal is, is the actual breaking of the seal and the opening of the scroll. So in other words, and this is one way that you could look at this, because we're going to see three sets of judgment. Uh, in a few moments, we'll get there. But you, you see this warning of what's coming in the seals. Think of it like a telescope. If you work with a telescope where you compress it and you get sections that you pull out, when you compress that telescope, think of that as the scroll, okay? And first, that first segment where everything is compressed, that's the seals, because it's saying this is what's coming inside. But when you pull out the first section, it's like the seventh seal represents, as you pull out that next section, seventh seal represents seven trumpets. What we will see as we go on in chapter 16 is when you pull out another section, the third section, the seventh trumpet represents now seven bowls, a pouring out of greater judgment into the earth. Um, as we go, we'll reinforce these truths. I believe it's a holy hush. Go to point B with me, please, in the notes. I want us to, for a moment, speak of this time of tribulation. There are a number of different passages this is not exhaustive. I'm giving you samples here, but also from various versions, translations. I'm giving you different names that are used in English to describe the Greek words, the original words, to describe what is coming. As a matter of fact, even Daniel chapter 12 and 1 um, is a Hebrew word. But, but, but there, Daniel 12, 1, Matthew 24, 29, Mark, you have these, these words there. You, time of trouble, tribulation, distress, anguish. What we're going to see described in different ways is the most unspeakable, unprecedented, intense period. Michael speaks this way to Daniel. Jesus speaks this way to his followers and says there is coming a time of intense suffering and judgment and it's never been like this in the world and it will never get worse again. In other words, this is it. This is the ultimate time of outpouring of God's judgment. And all of it, whether Daniel or the Lord Jesus, affixes it 
puts the context as the return of the Lord and the resurrection. We know that it's the end of time. There have been incredible times of suffering. Where was it recently? A message that I preached of, um, that only Jesus can bring peace because there has been, uh, forgive me, I'm, I'm uh, not remembering the exact number, but it is countless billions of people who have died in world history directly or indirectly through times of war. If I remember correctly, it was something like 3.7, if I remember correctly. 3.7 billion people have died through war and, uh, and, the, and the indirect effects of war. In other words, this has not been a peaceful world for millennia of time. And, uh, and yet, my point is this, even though, and, and, and I'm basing that upon right now, there are over 7 billion people alive. They say there are as many people who have died, lived and died already as living right now. So it's something between 14 and 15 billion people have lived on planet Earth. And so we're talking, you know, one-fifth of all the Earth world in world history, one-fifth of everybody has died in war. Think about that. And yet, here's my point. Jesus said, in that day, it'll be worse than it's ever been before. Something is coming of such cataclysmic, intense judgment and wrath that nothing, nothing everything pales, in, pales in, in, in contrast. Matthew 24, 21, Revelation. I'm not going to take time to read all the verses, but there, look at the phrases that are used. The great tribulation, great distress, great anguish. Revelation 3, 10, the hour of trial, the great time of testing. Now, you'll often hear of the seven-year tribulation. Where are we getting that? Let me just go there for a moment, okay? In various, and you have to um, let the scriptures translate, you know, uh, interpret the scriptures. You have to compare scripture with scripture. But you read of, in a prophecy, and I, I have this referred to here in Daniel chapter 9, it's called the 70-week prophecy. A week of seven years, so 490. And God reveals to Daniel that he has an appointment with the nation of Israel, and it's going to be a period of 490 years marked out. Very specific things. We don't have time, that will be another study. You look at that on your own in the book of Daniel. But the point is that there is a one week, the last week of 70. So the 70th week, a week of seven years, is the culmination. God said, that will wrap up my work with the nation of Israel. Do you, you follow what I'm saying? So we have yet to see this seven year period of time. This is where we're getting seven years. But is that borne out? Are we pressing this? Like, are we stretching that from the book of Daniel? Over applying it? I don't think so. And here's why. You have three and a half years, which is half of the seven, referred to in different ways. For instance, Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, 12, 7. Revelation 12 and verse 14 uses this phrase, both Hebrew and Greek. A time, times, so there's a doubling, and half a time. Now, that in itself doesn't necessarily mean three and a half, but then you compare, and you've got Daniel 12, 11, Revelation 11. Now you have a counting of days, 1,290 days. What does that add up to? It adds up to, if you're using lunar, and rather than solar years, lunar, which is how the Jewish people measure time, if you're using lunar years, it adds up exactly to three and a half years. You follow what I'm saying? So whether you say time times half a time, or you measure it by days, or there are times where, and here we have it, Revelation 11 and verse 2, and we'll, we'll read Revelation 11 just a few weeks from now, and chapter 13 and verse 5, you have this phrase, 42 months. How much is 42 months? Three and a half years. This is why we believe there are, there's going to be a shift in the middle of the seven years. I'm going to talk a lot about that something very significant. You've got three and a half years into the seven, halfway through. Then there's a shifting, another three and a half years. As we develop this, you will understand the significance of that. My point is this. I believe that the tribulation is going to be seven years of the most intense, unthinkable, indescribable judgment and wrath on planet Earth. Let's continue. Now, 
What is happening during this time? I think it's important for us to get everybody on the same page. I touched on it last week. Let me give you scripture here. I believe there are three primary developments or purposes, intentions that God has in allowing this time of what's known, different phrases, but tribulation. The first is this, that God does have an appointment with the nation of Israel. I do not believe that he's finished with the nation of Israel. You read in the textbook, I have a life application um, section there and I talk about God's plan and the miracle of the rebirth of the nation of Israel in 1948. God has a purpose for this nation. But there's something very interesting that Jeremiah speaks of in the context of the last days, of the end of time. And he calls it the time of Jacob's trouble. There's a time that's coming. Michael speaks of that in Daniel chapter 12. Unprecedented trouble is coming. But this is how Jeremiah, you have the, the passage here. Jeremiah, why don't, why don't we read that together? Again, have your Bibles in front of you. Let's read Jeremiah chapter 30. I would love to have different ones read this, but for the sake of the broadcast here uh, and time, I will just, just follow along with me. Jeremiah chapter 30. Look, look at this. Look at what it says here. Jeremiah 30 verse 4. These are the words of the Lord. Lord spoke concerning Israel and Judah. This is what the Lord says. Cries of fear are heard. Terror, not peace. Ask and see. Can a man bear children? Then why do I see every strong man with his hand on his stomach like a woman in labor? Every face turned deathly pale. Reminds me of what Jesus said. Men's hearts failing them for fear. It reminds me of what John records in Revelation 6 with the sixth seal. Men, and, and it, every strata lists seven different strata. In other words, the complete. The, God, God's looking at every human being. There is a crying out, running for the mountains to fall, and trying to hide in inanimate things. That, that's what we're seeing here. Look at verse 7. How awful that day will be. None will be like it. Where have we heard that? Daniel speaks of it. Jesus speaks of it. None will be like it. There have been people through history who have said, well, you can look at 70 AD, you can see what happened under General Titus and soon that he was the emperor and how they just annihilated, I mean, the nation of Israel for all intents and purposes in 70 AD, you know, ended until the resurrection in 1948. And people would say, well, that was it. Oh yeah, but I got to tell you, Hitler's Nazi Germany, as far as the Jewish nation, the Jewish people was an even more cataclysmic loss, perhaps seven times more than 70 AD. So how do you say 70 AD wraps it up when you have Daniel, Jeremiah, Jesus saying, it'll never be worse than this. It got worse. Nazi Germany for the Jewish people was worse. And yet we're told that there's a time coming in the context of the resurrection where God is in appointment with Israel and it will never be worse than that. This is what Jeremiah says. This is intense. Look at it. None will be like it. No day like it. It will be a time of trouble for Jacob. Get this. But he will be saved out of it. God has a plan. God is going to work in the nation. But I, get, I need you to get this. Because we're going to see it again when we get to chapter 11, especially there. We're going to be talking about God's working through the nation of Israel. And even developments that are happening today, real time. And how this may very well have significance to where, where what will happen during the tribulation. But my point is this. God says it is a time of chastening. It is a time of trouble. It is a time of intense even judgment. Because many of the Jewish people, just like Gentiles, will not turn to the Lord. And yet God will save the nation. God will rescue the nation. God has a plan. I believe what that means is there's a national revival for the Jewish nation. I told you, I think last week, uh, they, they, I, I can't tell you that this is definitive, but I'm, I received this as I was in Israel. I think I referenced this, a very high ranking person. I would trust his judgment. He said 80%, 80%. He's a Jewish messianic man, and his take was, from his perspective, 80% of Israel, Jewish people in Israel, understand that there are Arabs and so on. But when you look at the Jewish people in Israel, 80% are not practicing Judaism. 80%. God needs 
to visit the nation for the nation to cry out to him because they're not crying out to him. God is not finished. So that's the first thing that he does that we see here. But look on. It is also a time of satanically led rebellion and persecution. I said last week, it's like the final shaking in the fist, shaking the fist in the face of God. Jesus refers to it as Luke, in Luke 21, 24, he says these words, until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Jesus puts his return in the context. He's coming back when the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. If you study that, that, that phrase and what that means and go back to the book of Daniel, look at Nebuchadnezzar's dream, look at the dream that God gives to Daniel. I believe what's meant by the times of the Gentiles is this. All of the secular nations who have had the Jewish people under their thumb. And, you know, the last empire we could say, certainly that would be seen in the word of God and was real time for the apostle John would have been the Roman Empire. But many scholars refer to this as the revived Roman Empire. I'm gonna talk about that in weeks to come. Why, why would we even say it that way? But I believe what Jesus is saying is this, rebellion against the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, persecuting the people of God, the Jewish people, but also those who turn to the Lord Jesus, those who reject the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Gentile world, and they're going to come against. Now, when we get to chapter 13, you're going to see it. There's a beast who comes out of the water to the Jewish people, the sea. It says the first beast come, came out of the sea. The sea was a place of chaos. It was a place of darkness. It was a place of confusion. And in the Jewish mind, when they said the sea, they meant the Gentiles. It was a metaphor for the Gentile world. In other words, we would say the sea of humanity. That's how they looked at it. And I believe that God is saying right through that time, through the tribulation, and it is going to be corporately called Babylon. I'm not going to spend more time tonight talking of that. In future weeks, we'll talk of the Babylon world system. But my point is this. It's part of what's going on in Revelation. I'm, I'm sorry, in the tribulation. Part of the seven-year tribulation is that the spirit of Babylon, is it now? It's already here. It's already here. It gets expressed in the tribulation as a one-world government, a one-world economic system, a one-world very compromised church for three and a half years and something shifts. But yeah, we have elements of that now, but in the tribulation, the Gentile world will, it will be the culmination. It will be the ugliest time of rebellion in humanity's history, human history. Starting, you can go back to Nimrod in the early chapters of Genesis after the flood. Nimrod meaning rebellion in the Hebrew, the, the, the Hebrew word, rebellion. Rebellion starts. We're going to build a tower because no God in heaven is going to tell us what to do. We'll build a tower and just, you know usurp the authority of God. And we're going to, and, and that has continued through all of human history, but it culminates in the tribulation. So get this. You've got God's dealing with Israel. You've got humanity rising up. God is pouring out wrath, but the humanity does not repent. Please understand that. There will be people that do turn to the Lord. But the human population is called the inhabitants of the earth. And over and over again it says, and yet the inhabitants of the earth did not repent. In other words, there is a settled rebellion in the hearts of humanity. And Jesus said, I'm going to let it run its course. And it will prove God just. He must punish. See, it's part of the will of the Father. He's got to cleanse the earth of the rebellion. It's part of the reason why he's got to pour out his wrath. Because he wants to bring this earth restored back as an inheritance to the people of God. But right now, it's sold under sin. Right now, we have forfeited the inheritance. We need God to cleanse this earth. That's part of what happens. But then there's a third element development or intention and that is this follow with me there the outpouring of god's wrath you saw wrath go go back with me in chapter 6 of revelation revelation chapter 6 and verse 16 especially in this sixth seal you read these words and I think I'll just go to verse 16 and 17 they call to the mountains and the rocks fall on us and hide us from 
the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath, the Father and the Son, and certainly the Holy Spirit is involved in pouring out the wrath. Their wrath has come and who can stand? This, the third, and I, I think the greatest purpose for the tribulation, God said, is I need to punish rebellion in the earth. Now, individually, people will be thrown into the lake of fire. There's eternal wrath there. We understand that. But corporately, when God looks at it as Babylon, Babylon is falling. God said, by the time you get to chapter 18, you're going to see wrath. As a matter of fact, 10 times in the book of Revelation, you, you will see wrath in the context of God's wrath. God's wrath. He's angry at sin. He's got to put an end to this rebellion. Do you follow what I'm saying? And God, he has an appointment with planet Earth and the inhabitants of the Earth. So this is the most important part God, you say, well, why would you do that? Aren't you mer God is very merciful. I believe he actually blows the trumpets. He has the angels blowing the trumpets. He actually has the angels pouring out the, 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 the bold judgments. Why is he doing this? To get the attention of the earth. Because each time he says, but the inhabitants of the earth refuse to repent. They refuse to repent. What does that mean? God was trying to get their attention. God was trying to give them an opportunity. You're going to see it tonight. In the next few moments, when we, we see this, the, the first four trumpets blow and the details, what does it say over and over again? One third, one third, one third. Why? Why? You know what it means to me? And I don't know that it's like one third right down to the last exact one third of all the trees on planet Earth or one third of all the drops of water, molecules of water. No, I, I, I don't know that that's what it means. When you're dealing with apocalyptic literature, there's symbolism, but reality behind the symbolism. I think what God is saying is, I'm sparing two times more than I'm striking. In other words, I'm still merciful. I'm giving him time. I'm giving the earth time. I'm giving the people time. I want them to understand, almighty God, if he just, the, the breath of his nostril and I can wipe it all out. I think God is pleading with the earth in these judgments. Do I have to blow the next trumpet? Do I have to pour out the next bowl? I wish you would come to your senses. God, God pled. You, you read in the, book, uh, in, the, in, in the book of Isaiah. Reason, please. Let me reason with your heart. I'm pleading with you, Israel. Now God's pleading with humanity. Why don't you wake up? Why don't you wake up? Look, I don't think that God caused COVID-19, but I do believe that he allows things like this. And I think it's a wake-up call. I don't think it caused 9-11. But you know, people in that day, in that day, we switched. You know, you know what we did? We, we, we turned over. We heard the alarm clock, you know, metaphorically speaking. And we hit the alarm. And for a, a little while, for a few weeks, people got real religious. Remember 9-11? It was a wake-up call. People on the news, secular people, it's a wake-up call. It's a wake-up call. And all of a sudden, we just turned back. We hit the alarm, snooze button. And we all went back to sleep. And I think this is God's mercy. We look at his judgment and say, oh, Father, don't you care about people? And he's like, are you kidding? I only struck one third because I wanted a wake-up call and I spared two thirds. Follow that. God is still being merciful in this. Let's go on further. So how does his wrath, how is it poured out? I'm giving you here, I'm breaking this down, and I, I'm going to have to shift into high gear here for the sake of time. But there are three sets, three sets of judgments. The first set are the seals that we've already looked at in chapter 6. But I see them as warnings of what's coming. I see the six seals as preface saying what's inside the scroll reads like this. So in other words, pull out the two sections of the trumpets and the bowls. They're contained in the seals. But we'll look at the seals as warnings. Six, six seals broken, each with details of warning or general description anyway of what's coming. And then you come to, in this passage now as we moved on today, trumpets begin to blow. Seven angels before the throne of God. In chapter 8, four of the angels blow trumpets. We're going to look at the relevance of that. And I'm giving you the passages beginning in chapter 8 with the trumpet judgments. And then after the trumpet judgments, and there's a parenthetical section 
and we'll be doing some teaching in chapters 10 and 11 and 12. But then you get back into, there's going to be introduction in those chapters of different personalities, beasts, the false prophet and so on. Um, the dragon, you know, which represents the uh, Satan himself. Um, but, but then you get back to direct judgments and details and the bowls are even more intense than the trumpets. Go to point C with me. Let's move. This time of trouble, this tribulation ends, I want you to see this, because I want to talk about the rapture of the church this evening for a few moments. We've seen the church already in chapter 7, but I really didn't spend time to outline um, what the rapture is all about and a position that I hold and many, many evangelicals hold. Um, I believe this. That the time of trouble, the seven year, now you understand the seven years, the seven year tribulation ends with the return of the Lord. Sometimes we'll speak of the return of Jesus generally, or the second coming generally. I look at it as there are two phases of the second coming. There are contexts, passages where it shows that we go to meet the Lord in the air. Other passages where we come back with the Lord. So let me develop that. All of that has to do with the day of the Lord and has to do with the return of the Lord. If I say the revelation of Jesus, please understand, that means the second coming proper. That means when every eye sees him. That's when his feet touch the Mount of Olives. That's when Jesus sets up his kingdom. It is the finality of the, of the tribulation and now the introduction, the inauguration of the millennial reign of Christ. You'll understand that more as we go on. But that's what I mean by the revelation. Revelation means an unveiling, just like the name, the book, Revelation. It is undisclosed. It is, it is revealed for everybody to see. That is at the end, and we come back with Jesus at the end. Let me develop that. Let's go further. Follow this with me. Christ's revelation, now you know what that means, the very end of the seven years, comes visibly when his wrath has been completed. Let me take a few verses here. Zechariah, please turn there. Zechariah, the end of the Old Testament, just before Malachi, Zechariah in chapter 12. Zechariah 12 and verse 10. I just want to read a couple of passages here. Zechariah 12 and verse 10, and this also speaks to the nation of Israel and God's dealing. It says, And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. Zechariah is speaking in this context of the end of time, final world battle, what in the book of Revelation we know is the battle of Armageddon. You can see that in chapter 14. But look what it says. They, this is the grace of God. God has an appointment with the nation of Israel. They, the Jewish nation, will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. On that day, the weeping in Jerusalem will be great like the weeping of Hadad Rimmon in the plain of Megiddo. On that day, chapter 13 and verse 1, on that day a fountain will be opened to the house of David, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, to cleanse them from sin and impurity. When we know that that's only through the blood of Jesus Christ. That's only through the cross. But if you have 80% of the Jewish people not even observing Judaism, let alone Christianity as the fulfillment of Judaism, God needs to be gracious to this nation. But go on to chapter 14. Because people could say, oh, well, that just symbolically means that there are Jewish people that come to know Jesus. Well, thank the Lord. Your pastor is Messianic Jewish. Thank the Lord the Jewish people are being saved, but it's not a national revival. Look in chapter 14. Because now you get the context. Now you understand, oh, no, no, this is the end of time. This is the very last days when this supplication, this grace is poured out, this crying out to the Lord. A day of the Lord is coming, chapter 14, verse 1, when your plunder will be divided among you. I will gather all the nations to Jerusalem. Never happened yet. No matter how you cut it, stretch it, do gymnastics with all of this and try to make it happen, it has never happened that all the nations have come against the nation of Israel, or Jerusalem, the city. I will gather all the nations to Jerusalem to fight against it. 
The city will be captured. The house is ransacked and the women raped. Half of the city will go into exile, but the rest of the people will not be taken from the city. The, then the Lord will go out and get this. The world under the Antichrist, under the beast, both the system and the figurehead, a one world dictator, they're going to think that they're in control. They're going to think, let's go to Jerusalem. Why Jerusalem? Why Israel? This smaller than the state of New Jersey. Because it's the cross section of the world. Some people have even hypothesized that oil, which has been found there, that oil, it will be oil rich and all of a sudden it's going to be a hot spot to, to own. There are different, different thoughts on why, but God says, oh no, 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 I'm calling them there. I have an appointment with the armies of the earth. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And on that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem. And the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, forming a great valley. Do you know that the largest earthquake fault in the world? You know where the largest earthquake fault in the world is? Have you ever heard of the Rift Valley in Africa? I have stood there, I've looked as far as you can see. Do you know that the Rift Valley, that earthquake fault runs all the way up through Israel, where? Through the Kidron Valley on the east side of Jerusalem. It is part of the largest earthquake fault in the world and it runs right along the eastern side of the Temple Mount. Literally, that's what Zechariah sees. Could not have known that, that there was an earthquake fault there, let alone the greatest one. But he says, God has an appointment. And Jesus, this is his revelation, when he bodily, his glorified body, he's the Messiah, he's the God-man. But when he comes back visibly, the angel said, what are, you, what are you staring at? He's coming back in those clouds. He's coming back and his feet are going to touch the very same mountain where he left. When he touches down there, revelation actually in his, in his glorified body, it will split in two, a massive earthquake in that day. So what is this saying? We're talking about a visible return. I've given you those verses. Chapter 1 and verse 7 of Revelation says, And every eye will see him. I need to go on. But it says when he comes back at the end of the tribulation, he comes back with his holy ones. And I've heard people insist that is not the people of God, that are not Christians. Those are angels. I've heard people dogmatically say, oh, no, no, the, the, you know, Christians are going to go through the entire uh, uh, tribulation. Listen, I don't hold to that. And there are different reasons. I'm going to explain it as we go on. But one of the major reasons is that in order for us to come back with Jesus, we have to have gone to be with him. And can we prove that Christians are, I mean, people have said, no, those are angels, the holy ones and the saints, they're angels. So just follow with me quickly. Could we do this? First Thessalonians. Look at the passages here. First Thessalonians. Just do quickly Bible study. First Thessalonians chapter three and verse 13. Look what it says. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus Christ, Lord Jesus, comes with all his holy ones. Well, you could say holy ones that speaks of angels there. You, you could argue that that means angels and not believers, not Christians. Let's go on. Now, I think it's both, but for sake of argument. Second Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 7, it says this. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. No question about what's indicated there. Angelos, we're talking angels. Jesus is coming back and angels are going to uh, accompany. Go to the book of Jude, just before the book of Revelation. Look at that little book, Jude and verse 14. Jude verse 14. Are you there with me? Which is... Listening in, listen to this. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones. I mean, sanctified ones. It, it, it's holy ones. They could be holy angels. You could argue that. But there's another verse that you cannot argue with. And I believe that when Jesus comes back, and we're going to see it, especially when we get to Revelation 19, when Jesus comes back riding in that white horse, conqueror, but bringing in righteousness, Establishing his kingdom at the end of the tribulation, when he comes back, there are 
we are with him riding in white horses. How do we know that this, you know, besides chapter 19, go with me to Revelation chapter 14 for a moment. I must, I'm sorry, chapter 17, verse 14. Revelation chapter 17 and verse 14. And when Jesus comes back to finally destroy the armies of the Antichrist, the Babylon system, to overthrow, Jesus will conquer the battle of Armageddon. It is both a physical but also a spiritual. There is a, there is a, a convergence here in the physical realm, the natural realm, the spiritual realm. But who comes with Jesus? Who comes with it? Look in verse chapter 17, verse 4. They will make war against the Lamb. Who? The nations, the ten nation confederacy, which I think is just dividing the entire world into ten parts. When the time of the Gentiles, when the ultimate expression of rebellion against the Lord Jesus Christ, the world will fight against the Lamb. We're right at the end of the tribulation time. Follow this with me. But the Lamb will overcome them because he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Very name that you're going to read on the vestment of Jesus when he comes riding back in that white horse, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And with him, who's with him? Angels will be with him, absolutely. With him will be his called, chosen, and faithful followers. We come back with him. That's not angels there. They're not the chosen ones. They're not called faithful, okay? We know that they're holy angels. God will use them. This verse, I think, connects with other verses. I, I think it's angels, but I also think that we are coming back with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, before he returns with us, just follow this, he returns for us. I've got to refer to John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. John 14, Jesus said, in my father's house are many, well, mansions. I always memorize it that way. I was so disappointed when the NIV said rooms. Come on, I want mansions. I don't want just room. All right. Really, the word, uh, uh, it refers to dwelling places. It just means God's house is so big. By the way, I'm not looking for a mansion in heaven. Honestly, I'm not. I will not need a roof over my head in heaven. I don't need a big front door. I don't need a doorbell. Uh, okay? It's heaven. All right? It was a way in Old English to describe the dwelling place. It's really, really big, and the Father has plenty of room for everybody who comes to Jesus. That's the point. Amen. But you know what he says in my father's house are many rooms. And if it were not so, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I'm coming back. You know who spoke that? That every one of those disciples would know? A Jewish groom. When he proposed marriage at the arrangement of the father of the bride and the groom, he would say to his bride, for one year, I'm going to father's house. And in the Hebrew language would say, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Because he always built onto the father's house or on the property of the father. And by the way, after one year, and he is preparing while the bride is sanctifying herself and expecting his return. That's what we're doing right now. But it's the father that looks to the son and says, son, it's time. That's why Jesus said, no man knows the time. I've had people say, well, Jesus must not be God because he doesn't know the time of his return. Come on. Let the word of God. He's God. But what he's saying is it's the father's call. Because in the Jewish wedding custom, it was the father who said to the son, son, you prepared well. Go and get your bride. He is speaking the language of marriage when he says, I'm coming back for you. Jesus is coming back for his bride. He's coming to gather us to be with him. Let's move ahead. I believe at a time before his return to this earth, before the revelation, before the end of the tribulation, Jesus is coming back for his people. Now people will say in their different views on this, I hold to, well, let me just say this. We know this is the rapture of the church and I, I, I my goodness, um, we have a lot to cover yet. Let me let me accelerate here. We we may even have to take this in two parts. I'm not sure. Let me let me see what we need to do here. But we will be caught up. Now, there's a fancy long Greek word there, but in the Latin Bible, it's raptus. 
And it means a gathering, a catching up. That's where we get the word rapture. I believe that before Jesus comes back visibly, he's going to come back for us. He's going to catch us to be with him. That's 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Then it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that we will be changed. He's coming back. And this is our resurrection moment. On the way up in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. It's not a long process. You blink your eye. I told you what my daughter had said when she was a little girl. Daddy, I'm afraid. Just blink your eye. Just like that. Just boom. We're in the presence of God. Glorified bodies. This is the rapture of the church. Another passage, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 1, are gathering to be with him. I believe in what is called. And am I dogmatic about it? Am I insistent about it? Well, I, I, I am. Please understand that this is not a matter of salvation if you're mid-trib or post-trib, okay? I feel very strongly about premillennial. I do believe that we're that Jesus is coming back for us before the millennial reign of Christ. I think it's the real millennium. I believe it's the first thousand years of an eternal kingdom. Why? Because Jesus is going to restore the earth and righteousness the way that it was always meant to be, because that's our inheritance. But I do believe, and I feel very strongly about a pre-trib rapture. In other words, before the rapture. Why? Now, I'm giving you seven reasons here. That could be another hour. So let me do this. Let me do this. And then I'll check with Pastor Ralph. I'm going to skip over this part because my assignment was to teach through chapter 8 tonight. We may come back to this, but I would urge you to read the reasons there. Because I, I, whether, uh, maybe next week, we'll, 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 we'll carve out time and I want us to be very specific on these seven reasons. But I will give you two of them repeating because we've already mentioned this. I believe that the tribulation is wrath. I don't believe in double, double jeopardy. Jesus took my wrath on the cross. This is about wrath. It is, yes, there will be people that turn to the Lord Jesus. 144,000 servants of the Lord. I think they're Jewish witnesses. The two witnesses we'll see in chapter 11. I think the Holy Spirit will still be drawing people to, 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 the, to the Father through Jesus. I believe that's going to happen. I believe there's going to be persecution. But that is not the main purpose. People say, oh, you just want to run from persecution. That's ridiculous. It's already happening. Happening now more than ever. My point is, it's a time of wrath. God is going to pour out wrath like no other time in human history. I don't believe we're appointed to that. I believe Revelation chapter 3 and verse 10, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 9, we're not appointed to that wrath. I'm going to deliver you out of, ek, out from the time of trial that's coming upon the whole earth, it says, the inhabitants of the earth. That's language speaking to the rebellious world. I'm going to pour out my wrath, but you're not appointed to that. That speaks strongly to me. But the last point, I'm just going to say this. We've already seen the church. And it has everything to do with how you interpret those seals. You cannot open the scroll real time until the seventh seal is broken. God makes it very clear. The body of Christ without number from all of the world is gathered in his presence before the scroll rolls open. Then there's a half an hour of silence telling us now the details, now the actual judgment. So uh, I snuck that in there. I don't know if you noticed that. But those are two of the seven reasons why I hold to this. And actually in another study, there are a lot more of these points that I bring out. Can I just, let's just highlight the rest of this. You've been so gracious. Let me highlight. The events that take place with the breaking of the seventh seal are a warning to all to be ready to meet the Lord in the air. I'm going to go super fast highlighting here. What's the first part? The appearance of seven angels before the throne of God. Verse 2. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God. In Jewish theology, it is taught that there are seven assigned angels. I mean Judaism. Seven assigned angels. Well, this would seem to bear that up. And to them were given seven trumpets. 120 times, just follow with me, 120 times in scripture, the blast of a trumpet, whether that was the shofar, the ram horn, or a silver, metallic, silver, rolled um, trumpet, silver trumpet, you have it here, I believe this fits more the silver trumpet, I believe it's a call to war, I believe it's rallying 
the angels of God. Judgment is coming. But then something happens. You've got seven angels before the throne. But then there's the appearance of an eighth angel. Look at verse 3. Another angel who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer. Incense, by the way, is often a picture, and I'm giving you some scripture, a picture of prayer. Like it ascends, sweet-smelling savor in the nostril of God. Prayer is like that. That's what we see here. With the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. There, there are details. You can study this. But what is this? Another angel. Some people have said, well, maybe this is Jesus. Well, first of all, Jesus was the one that just opened the, the, the seventh seal. Second of all, Jesus is not an angel. I know in the Old Testament, and I've already told you, angel can simply mean messenger. And that's how some people will say this. Oh, Jesus as the messenger. We're not saying a created angel with wings. No, but I don't believe that. Why? Because the Greek language is very, very specific and detailed. It says, alas, angel. It means another of the same kind. A created angel just like the other seven. We're not talking Jesus here. We're talking another powerful angel steps up. An eighth angel steps up. He is given incense. So what is the incense? What is this burning? What is this incense that's rising? And it's mixed with the prayer. I think what it's saying is the people of God. We're at the throne of God and we're praying. You know what we're praying? Basically as you pray now. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. In other words, we are aligning our hearts in prayer. It's like we're saying, Father, I don't even understand except that holy hush. What are we going to know? What are we going to see? What are we going to be thinking in that moment? Judgment. Judgment. Unthinkable judgment. But somehow we're going to pray, have your way, God. Have your way, God. Do what you need to do. Cleanse the earth. Bring it back into agreement with you, Father. Thy will be done. We're praying. We're active in this. Follow this. See, our ultimate victory in Jesus anticipates God's righteous resolution of all things. The smoke of the incense, verse 4, together with the prayers of the saints, went up before God from the angel's hand. Clearly, our prayers matter. They matter now. They're going to matter then before the throne of God. It says, then the angel took the censer. What is censer? It is a fire pan. It's what the, 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 the priests in the Old Testament would bring the fire and, 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 and use that to, 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 uh, to, to mix with incense before, you know, the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies. There was significance. It represented prayer. The fire also represents holiness. And follow what happens. He filled it with fire from the altar and hurled it on the earth. There's fire that's coming. And it's mixed with prayer. We're in agreement with God. And he hurls it into the earth. And there came peals of thunder and rumblings and flashings of lightning. And I'll give you different verses here. Study these on your own, please. Isaiah 29, 6. Over and over again, it, it refers to judgment that's coming like a storm. Thunder. Wind. God is going to breathe out judgment on planet earth. And we are in agreement with the Lord. Let's move ahead. Then we come, we're going to summarize now. We're going to move quickly. The sounding of the first four trumpets. Seven angels, verse six. Seven angels now are given authority from God. And they're sounding out judgment. They're declaring war. They're rallying the troops. Angels uh, are, are, are on commission. And, and, and all of nature will obey the, 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 the decree of the Lord. Wrath is being poured out. And it says the first trumpet. Let's, let's, let's read it here. Right in the text, chapter 8. Read exactly the, the words. Verse 6. Then the seven angels who had seven, had the seven trumpets prepared to sound them. The first angel sounded his trumpet. And there came hail and fire mixed with blood and it was hurled down upon the earth a third of the earth was burned up a third of the trees were burned up and all the grass green grass was burned up when it speaks of blood here is it talking about the color like it's red the hail is and hail and fire and it's red like blood or is it talking about the carnage that happens when it hits people or is it actually saying that there's blood mixed into this i have it here it's as if the lord is saying if it's blood that you thirst for because humanity has been bloodthirsty or maybe it's the countless hundreds of millions of babies who have been aborted on demand around the world 
a major portion of that in the United States, there's blood on our hands. There is. There is blood on our hands. And, and it may be that God is saying, if it's blood you thirst for, then blood you will have. But look what is a third of the earth was burned up. And this is a massive ecological devastation. Now, I in in and I, I'm not gonna go into detail here, but I'm I'm telling you that there can be I it's very, very possible because the descriptions that are given in these first four trumpets can can sound very much like nuclear explosions and the fallout of nuclear. It may be that we're talking human weaponry. It could be. But even if it is human weaponry, and that's part of this, God is allowing it. God is managing it. And the inhabitants of the earth, chapter 6 and verses 16, 16 and 17, the inhabitants know it's the wrath of God. It's the wrath of God. God may, by removing his hand of protection, allow some of this to be nuclear. nuclear. On the other hand, do you know that God can cause nuclear fission and nuclear fusion? Do you know that God can do that? He doesn't need somebody to push a button in an office somewhere. You understand that? But what it sounds like very much, so for instance, look at what I have here. Nuclear explosions bring immediate firestorms, winds in excess of 250 miles per hour when there's a nuclear blast. Whether we're talking nuclear holocaust, neutron bomb, napalm bomb, it consumes everything. I give you this, in the early testing of the atom bomb, you know what they noticed? This was out in the South Pacific. The water rose thousands of feet in the air. What happened? It froze and came down like hail. There were hail storms associated with atomic nuclear explosions. It could be that that's what we're speaking of here in part. This is John's way of describing it. Second trumpet, let's read it. The second angel sounded his trumpet and something like a huge mountain all ablaze was thrown into the sea. A third of the sea turned into blood. A third of the living creatures into the sea died and a third of the ships were destroyed. What is he speaking of? Something like, he says it's like a mountain. This blazing mountain, it's formed in the heavens but it falls into the sea. Maybe it's the Mediterranean Sea, that's what John would have known. Is it an asteroid, a meteor, a comet there? there, there you know, a, a star would annihilate the Earth because a star is like incredibly larger than the Earth. So it wouldn't be a star. But the word for star can mean anything strewn through the heavens. I think we're talking asteroid or comet or a meteorite. And I think that there's one that is so massive. And when an asteroid comes through the sky, or not, then uh, actually when it's a meteorite, and it, 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 it's, it's what we would describe as a shooting star. If that hits the Earth, and some of them are known to be 600 uh, 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 feet across, okay, if, if that's the case, and, and this would have to be something that is ablaze and it falls into the sea, but what does this mean? Blood. Well, it could mean that there's death and destruction in actual blood, but it's also thought, well, maybe it could produce a red tide because a red tide is an explosion of microscopic algae and it has toxins and it brings death wherever it goes. Maybe that's what's being dis discussed here uh, and described here. And a third of the ships, are, maybe it's a mega tsunami because all the, a third of all the ships in the sea are wiped out. There is massive death. But here's the point once again, one third destruction, one third, God says, I will spare two times more than I strike. Let's go on. Let's move on. The third, verse 10, the third angel sounded his trumpet and a great star blazing like a torch fell from the sky on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. In other words, God, God himself is bringing this. Another heavenly body. It's blazing like a torch. If it's a meteor, we know that it's going to look like fire. It's going to, it's on fire because of the friction, the atmosphere, hitting the atmosphere. Um, I have here this note, the strontium-90. This is a radioactive isotope. When you have nuclear fission or, or fusion, it produces uh, um, a radioactive isotope produced by nuclear fission. And this will poison and already has been known to poison fresh water sources. Is what is being described here something? Perhaps there's human intervention, but God's still in control. 
I have no problem if God uses that, but I also think that he is directly sending wrath and judgment. And he is the one, you know, I'll just say it this way. Scientists today, it's incredible what God has allowed scientists to understand. Electron uh, 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 microscopes, you know, they, they, can, they can see and they can describe sub sub atomic particles but you know what still they call it the atomic glue they do not know what holds the atom together they can look at it they can see the electrons protons neutrons they they believe that they know they can describe vibrating strings the m theory but they don't know yet what holds it together you know in second peter chapter three god says he's going to rescind the word he holds every atom in place. It's the atomic glue. It's not natural. It's God's word. He's going to call back the word. And I believe that God can directly cause nuclear fission and fusion that would look like this on the earth. Let's go. Verse 12. The fourth angel sounded his trumpet and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, a third of the stars. In other words, there is darkness. So that a third of them turned dark, a third of the day was without light, also a third of the night. Follow with me here. You have Joel, Amos, Zephaniah out of the Old Testament. Jesus also spoke this way. The day of the Lord is going to bring abject darkness on planet Earth. What do you think happens when there's physical darkness on planet Earth? We already are, you know, people agnostics and atheists are shaking their heads saying what in the world is going on these are not normal times christians are saying what's happening this is so different what do you think is going to happen i was in new york city during the great blackout in 1977 two days of blackout unbelievable what happened in new york city in two days of darkness it was in the billions of dollars back in the 70s overnight of what was happening, of destruction. What do you think is going to happen when physical darkness comes to this earth? This is going to be a time, and yet we're only talking, I believe, in the first three and a half years of the tribulation. So let me wrap up in this. You have been so gracious. I've taught a little bit longer tonight. We wrap up. There is a secular, godless, God-denying, and God-defying idea and it rules the hearts of humanity. You have a scripture verse there out of Second Peter. I would urge you to read this, but the bottom line is this. We are very, very close. I believe that there's nothing yet to hold back the coming of the Lord for his bride. I believe in the imminent return of the Lord. He keeps telling us in the book of Revelation, it's coming quickly, I come quickly acceleration of the signs of the times but we're not looking at signs we're looking for jesus there's a hope in our heart and i think you know it too there's a growing anticipation jesus is coming jesus is coming father thank you we see this judgment and it's horrific we think of our loved ones we think of those who do not know you we think of the inhabitants of this earth you will be merciful to your people because we are washed in the blood and you have taken our wrath for us. But right now in this moment, because today is the day of salvation, your patience, just like in the days of Noah, your patience is running thin now. There's so much rebellion. And yet the door of the ark is still open. It is still day. We need to labor while it's still there. We need to tell people of you, your love and mercy. But Father, if there's one person listening, or right now I'm going to ask for every person listening, whether here in this, this room or in the cars or online, if you have an unsaved loved one, I want you to speak their name right now to the Lord. Because now the Spirit of God is still knocking. Jesus is knocking at the heart's door. It is still cold day. There's still opportunity. It is not too late yet. Time is running short, though. Time is running short. I pray that every person here, every person who hears my voice right now speaking these words, God, would be ready, would be ready. Every time you spoke of your return, it was all about being ready, be ready, don't be 